Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Tuesday, December 5th, 2023. Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski is here with us today to address this. How many dead, innocent Palestinian civilians are too many dead, innocent Palestinian civilians? But first this. Judge Napolitano here. The world is falling apart and the government wants to spend money to try and save it. The Israelis are defending themselves from the greatest onslaught in their history. Ukraine is collapsing. We are trying to fund both on borrowed money and borrowed time. The Federal Reserve keeps raising interest rates so everything you own is worth less and everything you earn can buy less. What can you do about it? You can buy gold and silver, the most stable commodities on the planet in the past 3,000 years. The government can't print more of it and can't interfere with it. Where should you buy your gold and silver? Do what I did and go to Lear Capital. Call 800-511-4620 or go to learjudgesnap.com. You'll have a very interesting conversation with a very knowledgeable person. No heavy pressure. And if you want to diversify what's in your IRA from stocks and mutual funds, consider physical gold and silver. Ask about a gold-backed IRA, you can take this information and discuss it with your spouse. And when you call, find out if you can qualify for up to $15,000 in bonus gold or silver. Call today, 800-511-4620, learjudgenap.com. When you talk to them, tell them the judge sent you. Do you believe that, um, uh, Karen, uh, Colonel Karen, it's a pleasure. Welcome here, my dear friend. Uh, do you believe that uh, Vice President Harris actually said something as boneheaded uh, as too many dead, uh, innocent Palestinian, Palestinian civilians? I couldn't believe that, that she said that because, I mean, if you listen to what she says, it's like, well, there's a certain number that are, it's okay, but we've, we've exceeded that number. Um, you know, it's, it's just funny, but she, she is uh, hilarious anyway. Here's, here's the clip. Uh, here's the clip of her saying it just over the weekend. President Biden and I have also been clear with the Israeli government in public and in private many times. As Israel defends itself, it matters how. The United States is unequivocal. International humanitarian law must be respected. Too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. So, we have given them 15,000 bombs, 57,000 artillery shells. They are slaughtering innocents and leveling Gaza. And she's saying international law must be respected. And there's some magic number below which they can be killed and above which they can't. That's the import of her statement. Who would believe her? No, no, you, she can't be believed. And, um, and also, uh, I mean, what a spokesman that we have. I mean, you have Biden and then our second, the vice president is this one who uh, really, you know, she's just not competent. I mean, she she looks authoritative, but what she says, it shows no thought at all, no understanding of what she's saying. Um, there's many ways she could have said, different ways that she could have said and sent the same message. Um, and she didn't, she chose not to. She chose to basically lie saying that, we, the United States, has interest in seeing international norms of uh, humanitarian rules or whatever, uh, just war, or whatever. She, she's acting like we care about that. We don't. And then she, she puts in the thing about too many innocent, which she didn't have to say that. She just said she could have said innocent Palestinians are being killed. This is unacceptable. Um, but she didn't say that because honestly, you know, I don't, I, don't, uh, I think she is in much agreement with both the Biden administration, his advisors, and the Netanyahu government. Uh, they're all in this together. Uh, everybody's making some money, and um, they're, they're quite happy to uh, to support Israel in whatever Israel chooses to do. You know, just to push this aside a little bit, she is, of course, a heartbeat away from the presidency. And a heartbeat away from her is Mike Johnson, the new Speaker <laughs> of the House. Yeah. Who, when asked what his first priority was as speaker, Scott Ritter pointed this out in a clip we did uh, last week, mm. uh, said, my guideline is the Bible. 
and my first priority is helping Israel. Wait a minute. You're number two in line to be president of the United States. Your guideline is the Bible, and your first priority is Israel, not the Constitution? Yep, this that's, is what we have. That's what we're confronted with. you got a liberal uh, Democrat, Kamala Harris, and a conservative Republican, Mike Johnson, both members of the war party, mm -hmm. saying virtually the same thing about Israel. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, we, we've, the, our government, Washington, D.C., has been uh, so successfully co-opted uh, and owned uh, by Israel for many, many years, um, decades. And the success, it, it's a system of success. Um, if you are elected uh, and you do not support or vote the way Israel wants or advocate for Israel in the appropriate, with the appropriate enthusiasm, and you don't fund Israel in every way possible and forgive Israel in every way possible all the time. If you do not do those things, we will stop your political donations. We will run a primary against you. We will support the other party's candidate against you. It, it is Israel is not concerned whether it's Democrats or Republicans. They simply need loyal Israeli Israel supporters. Uh, as in, in the in the Congress, and they need them in both parties, and they they need a significant majority. They are not willing to to say, oh, it has to be fifty one percent. They want a significant majority of the votes in the in the House and the Senate to support whatever Israel wants to do. Um, and that's it's that simple. Uh, and it works. Their their pattern of uh, influence has worked very well. APEC is not registered as a foreign lobbying entity, I don't believe. Uh, it has escaped that, even though so many other organizations are clearly closely regulated. APEC is not. Um, it, it's just a successful model. And if I was a country and I wanted to have uh, aid, influence, uh, maybe distributed power as a result of my influence over another country, uh, especially a larger one, what a great what a great role model i mean they've done it and uh they've shown that it can be done uh this is what we live with and you know we got mike johnson i think the people thought oh mike johnson he's going to be a real constitutionalist because you know he's a baptist from texas he's going to love the constitution sure sure um she literally said too many innocent palestinians have been killed question Karen, Colonel Karen, does the Netanyahu government believe that any Palestinians are innocent? No, the Netanyahu, Netanyahu himself does not believe that. His his uh, alliance of, of right wing parties does not believe that. And I would, I think, from what I can gather, most Israelis don't believe that. Um, the the level of contempt in Israeli society for uh, Palestinians in particular. Arabs in general, but Palestinians in particular, is uh, cultivated uh, in schools, in in every aspect of society. So I don't think Americans can really understand how, how they really feel, how many of them, how most of Israel feels about uh, these Palestinians. And they, to them, are all terrorists. They're all murderers. And if they're not grown up yet, like their children, they'll, they'll be terrorists, they'll be murderers. So what better way to nip it in the bud? Um, this is, this sounds very evil and like, I'm just making stuff up, but um, the information from people that live in Israel kind of reveals that this is the case. Um, don't, don't some cabinet members or haven't some cabinet members, uh, uh, Netanyahu cabinet members, uh, referred and and some of their american apologists even a few at least one former colleague of mine where i used to be employed for 24 years mm -hmm. consider the palestinians to be subhuman subhuman and they use that word um which is interesting because you know our country is you know we have a lot of the diversity equity stuff the wokeness the we have a long history of civil rights movement um, a conversation, an ongoing conversation about racism in our country. And we don't, um, if, if we, if any person in this country of any race called another group of people subhuman, 
that would set off alarm bells in in almost every American's mind because we don't use that language and we and we don't use that language because it is so dangerous. Um, it's dehumanizing. It is hateful in a way that leads to death. I mean, it leads to death and murder. Um, contempt is actually worse than hate in some ways. That's what they say anyway. And the contempt that uh, many in Israel, many Israelis feel towards their neighbors, towards their uh, the Palestinian population, even those that are uh, Israeli citizens, the same. The, the feeling of contempt that they have for them is um, it's something I don't think most Americans can really imagine. And it is often, I think, well hidden uh, from the American population, uh, how uh, many in Israel actually view uh, these people. So for us, we think they're innocent Palestinians, but those two words don't go together for most Israelis. They don't see right. them as innocent. Uh, at the risk of raising your blood pressure even more, <laughs> Colonel Karen, here's uh, Vice President Harris with her and President Biden's five-point plan post-Gaza. So we all want this conflict to end as soon as possible and to ensure Israel's security and ensure security for the Palestinian people. We must accelerate efforts to build an enduring peace. And that begins with planning for what happens the day after the fighting ends. Shortly after October 7th, President Biden and I began discussions with our national security team about post-conflict Gaza. We have begun to engage partners in the region and around the world in these conversations. And this has been a key priority over the last eight weeks. Five principles guide our approach for post-conflict Gaza. No forcible displacement, no reoccupation, no siege or blockade, no reduction in territory, and no use of Gaza as a platform for terrorism. We want to see a unified Gaza and West Bank under the Palestinian Authority. And Palestinian voices and aspirations must be at the center of this work. If I told you what I wanted and at the same time was giving billions in cash to bring about the opposite of what I said I wanted, you would think I was crazy. Yeah. I mean, Every one of those no, 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 no's. The U.S. is paying the Israelis, as we speak, mm -hmm. to do the opposite. That's true. And not only that, we have funded them prior to October 7th for many years to do exactly what she says we won't tolerate, you know, uh, to uh, uh, isolate the Palestinians, to support. We haven't supported a two-state solution. We have worked uh, very uh, diligently to make sure that doesn't happen, to uh, uh, Israel doesn't want it, and uh, we have not... Uh, put any pressure at all on Israel to, to move in that direction. This idea that uh, Palestinians won't be displaced, this is, that's insane. The first time, the first bomb that they, well, first off, the Palestinians have already been displaced. It's a daily process. But from the very moment that bombs started flying over Gaza, the whole purpose and the conduct of that um, Israeli military action has been to displace. It has been precisely to displace. In fact, they say, we're not trying to kill them. We, 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 put, we told them we were going to bomb. We want them to move south. Uh, they, they admitted this in English. Okay, they, This is a displacement strategy, um, which we supported. I mean, yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what, she, I, you know, she was in, she was at the COP28, I guess, or whatever it is, the, the environmental uh, meeting with many uh, global players uh, present. I think everybody in that audience must have been just amazed uh, to hear the words coming out of her mouth when many of them already know well what American policy is and has been. Well, everybody in that audience knows that her boss could stop all of this with a phone call to Bibi, a phone call, and it would be stopped in, in fewer than 24 hours. Now, she was with some heads of state, a lot of uh, uh, climate uh, people 
uh, a lot of people just below heads of state like her level, but they all know. And tell me if I'm wrong, Karen, from your years in the military and your wisdom and, and vision. If the U.S. does not aid Israel, it loses. If the U.S. says to Israel, stop, it stops. I think that if it says stop, it doesn't stop. But if we stop the aid, if we uh, pretty much, you know, we, we cancel the contracts immediately, we hold uh, whatever is owed to us or what we owe to Israel, we, we, that's it. It's done. We, we freeze that. Yes, that can, that can do a lot. Um, in fact, our, our example would be an amazing thing if we would do that. Um, but the language, the words are, they don't, they don't really matter. What matters, and it's, I hate to call it the deep state, but it's kind of the pre-existing, the long-term uh, powers that be in Washington, uh, which are heavily pro, uh, pro-Zionist, pro uh, pro the Israeli state at all costs and all excuses granted. That, that, that message, I mean, that group of people that would have to produce that message cannot say no to Israel. Israel controls and guides and owns that level of policymaking. So even if the president said, I would, I would compare this if, let's say Joe Biden, he says, that's it, that's it, baby, stop, and nothing else is coming your way, including everything else we've promised, it's all on hold, pull your troops, you've, you've punished them, that's it. He, so he says that. Well, I remember when President Trump said, we're going to pull the troops from Syria because they don't need to be there. It's an illegal uh, occupation and protection of oil in the north. Pull them out. He said that to the Pentagon. What did the Pentagon tell him? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll do that. And they did not do that. Okay. So um, they're not obedient to the president. So even if Joe, and let's throw Kamala in there, even if Joe and Kamala said this, it's actions that speak louder than words. And our actions as a, as a state, our decisions for Middle East foreign policy very much run through uh, the ruling party in Israel right now. Now, if Israel was run by a left-wing peace party, I don't know what would be. But right now, Israel is run by a party that has very tight control over our political machinations and our state decision-making with regard to Israel. They control it. So it doesn't really matter what Kamala says. It doesn't matter what Joe uh, says or doesn't say. Uh, your your actors, argument is, I want to make sure you understand it, your argument is uh, that politically, or at least from the PR end or from the financial end, uh, Israel has more control over the U.S. than the U.S. does over Israel. Yes, I think so. And um, I think that's proven and borne out by the evidence that we have, um, not just in this example, but in many examples, because for many years, over 30 years, uh, we have been in, in the State Department has had a project to work towards a two state solution or peace or some kind of an equity that allows um, both Palestinian prosperity as well as uh, Israel's state and its prosperity. And this has been spoken by multiple administrations and worked on by career State Department people and others. And yet, and yet it has gone nowhere. It has gone nowhere because the people working on it didn't want it to go anywhere. Right. Um, so it, it, w words are kind of meaningless at, at some point. We have to look at our actions and um, our actions are very much exactly as Bibi Netanyahu would like them to be right now. Anyway, we'll see what happens later. Here's uh, the journalist, uh, Max Blumenthal, uh, who comes on the show um, and who agrees with you and me on nearly everything, uh, addressing this very issue uh, late last week. Well, the, the Biden administration could end the occupation of Palestine tomorrow. They could right. have a Palestinian state while we're doing this live stream. All they have to do is say no more spare parts for your F-16s, no more F-35s, and it's over. Because Israel depends, in, its occupation depends entirely on its direct line to Washington. And Biden won't do that. And Tony Blinken won't do that because Tony Blinken comes from a long line of Israel lobbyists. I think you probably agree with that. I, I thought you'd appreciate his reference to spare parts for, uh, yeah. for jet planes since that was your your field for a while. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's true. Um, uh, yeah, we, we, have, we have power we don't exercise. And then we have power we think we have that we don't have, like we, like we, like we see in Ukraine. In fact, I thought it was funny listening to 
Kamala, talk about immediately, as soon as this broke out, we were immediately thinking about the post-conflict plan. I, I wonder where she was uh, over the past two years <laughs> with Ukraine. You know, we, we don't want that war to end. You know, we're, we're, we have a different strategy in Ukraine. We'll continue that as long as, you know, until the last Ukrainian dies. Um, have uh, Israeli governments been plotting for years for the opportunity to take over all the land from the river to the sea? I, I can't say if all Israelis agree with that, but certainly uh, uh, the right side, the right wing parties uh, in the pro-Zionist uh, parties, definitely. This is, in fact, from the river to the sea started as a, you know, in his Israeli phrase, a vision of uh, a homeland for, you know, part of the Zionist uh, uh, project. So, uh, yeah, I think it's very consistent. And they see this this idea of seeing Palestinians that live there as subhuman, as not very uh, just hateful, terrible, murderous people that need to be killed. Um, you know, this is uh, th this is an accepted value system, really, that they have. And I, I you know, I, I'm not I'm not Israeli and I can't say exactly. But um, I do think many Americans don't have any concept of how Israel views um, their countries, their national interest, or their vision for their country. I don't know, Karen. How do you how do you see this ending? Well, the neg I the depressing when I'm you know I, I think there's a depressing end, which is the uh, turning Gaza into a moonscape with um, you know contaminated, you know, salt, they're going to flood the, flood the tunnels with salt water from the ocean, you know, uh, just make it completely inhospitable and inhabitable for any person um, and turn it into some sort of barrier zone initially and eventually repopulate it with uh, uh, probably with Western investment, <laughs> U.S. money to, uh, to rebuild it as, as part of Israel proper. That's one view. And the Palestinians that survive um, that problem gets the can gets kicked down the road and of course many will die and uh and they will become even more of a diaspora so that's one view but and that's one possibility and i think it's the one bb netanyahu uh wants frankly uh and he wants to make it happen as rapidly as possible there is another outcome and, and this actually over time will will happen and that is the alienation of uh, israel and particularly its government but also israel as a nation the alienation that it has created for itself. Uh, we, we're, the United States is already largely alienated three quarters of the rest of the world by our actions. But Israel is, is uh, doing it in a very uh, conscientious way uh, of, by murdering and taking this land and refusing to, uh, to basically make a policy based on your hatred uh, right. and your contempt for people. They are showing hatred and contempt for all of their neighbors. Um, their neighbors have other opportunities for friends, not just American friends. As we see, as the world becomes multipolar, we have, uh, uh, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia can talk to each other. Um, China exists as a friend to many of these countries that might have wanted to be friends with Israel, but they don't have to be. And so Israel, I think, is going to further isolate itself. And I think this is what uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin said about a strategic error, about strategic errors being made by Israel. And I think that's what he's talking about, this long-term uh, global uh, judgment that is going to be made about Israel and its goodness, its trustability, its trustworthiness, its kindness, its, uh, its uh, existence as a fellow nation in a world of nations. Uh, I think it's uh, going to hurt itself. And the world is changing. You know, we're de the world is de-dollarizing. Um, multiple investment opportunities and opportunities for growth and prosperity all around the world are popping up everywhere. They're not being created by the United States. In fact, we're fighting many of those movements, but it's happening. So right. the, the neighbors that Israel has, um, they are they are burning bridges with these guys. And look at Turkey. I mean, Turkey and Israel had spent decades working together and progressing to a level of trade and discussion and co-op, you know, working on projects together. And this one, this, this destruction of Gaza, this single-headed, single-minded murder by the state of these people 
has caused you know Erdogan to lead. He, he's not just sitting in Turkey where people are rioting for the Palestinians and against Israel. He's leading that. He's calling for the arrest of Netanyahu as a as a war criminal. This is all of that work done to have Israel to to productively live with its neighbors in the in that land. Threw it out the window in three days. It's gone because of the right. way they're behaving. So um, the world can, the people of the world who condemn this will make choices and they will make choices not to support Israel. They will make choices not to vote for Israeli supporting politicians. They will make choices not to purchase Israeli products. They will boycott companies that have bombed, that have provided the weapons and the bombs to kill Palestinians. And that movement has already happened, the BDS movement and others, but this will continue to grow and it will hurt Israel in the long run. Um, if they can't, and I don't understand why they can't see this, but I think Bibi very much is scared of his own, for his own, his own political life, his own ability to stay out of jail. Um, you notice he, he never took responsibility for October 7th. He had every opportunity to at least say he had the support. He could have at least say this happened on my watch and I'm going to fix it. This is, you know, but he didn't do that. He pointed the fingers everywhere, but himself. And, um, in a sense, that's kind of a little, um, that's a little icon of Israel's whole policy. You know, they are handling this in such a way that um, as it's happening and after it's happened, uh, Israel gets no points from anybody in the world. And those, our country is in trouble because Americans see this and uh, we're not proud of it. Americans are not proud of, uh, of how we are conducting ourselves. Karen, um, articulate as always. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your insight. Thanks for your time. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Judge. Sure. Appreciate it. Sure. We we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next week. And by the way, your uh, great column, Israel's New Map Part One, uh, <laughs> is posted uh, at judgenap.com for those who want to see it there. Great piece. Great piece. Uh, four o'clock, Scott Ritter, four o'clock Eastern, right here. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.